Okay, I'm gonna pick up where we left off. <clears throat> and I'm gonna just give you a little overview as we go into looking at specific world traditions and where people may experience trauma as gender and sex minorities and what parts of those religious and spiritual traditions might be contributing to religious trauma. So um, one thing to say is that most societies, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of societies around the world have had other understandings of gender and thus of sex relations um, that are not binary. In other words, there may be a, you know, more, than, more than two genders. Uh, there, and then what, what it means to be in a same-sex relationship if there are multiple genders, uh, not just two, uh, this idea of opposite sex, it, it doesn't really hold up anymore. So um, the three basic binary assumptions that underlie Western categories of gay and trans are not universal. So some ideas that certain religions may promote as being universal that actually are not universal are the assumption that there are only two sexes, male or female, that there are only two sexualities, gay or same sex attracted or straight and opposite sex attracted, and that there are only two genders, man and woman, and that those line up with biological sex. Um, which, you know, anyway, so it, that's, there's polygendered traditions and there's, there's much more fluidity in, in other traditions, um, outside the West and even within the West, there are streams, uh, that are not binary in that way. All right. So basically what I want to look at is that, um, the idea that same sex relationships were wrong. Um, is not really even something that comes entirely from Western culture or what it wasn't universal even within Western culture and it wasn't innate to Christianity or the religions that we think of as Western religions, even though they're Middle Eastern religions. Um, so in ancient Greek and Roman societies, actually um, the relationship between men and younger males was an important part of male socialization. Uh, Same-sex unions were actually, there's evidence that same-sex unions were blessed even within Christianity during its first few centuries. Um, or the, at the very least, there was some kind of equivalent same-sex blessing uh, between intimate partners. May not have been exactly like marriage, but it was something, it, it certainly wasn't anti gay you know um so what happens is what what the heck happened in 342 that's the date that i have here for you to remember is that uh the christianity becomes a religion an official and protected religion of the roman empire a few years before that in 312 um and then the emperors of the roman empire uh in 342 decide that boundary crossing between male and female roles. In other words, being a man who's receptive, being a man who in their eyes takes the woman's role. Um, that's the thing that causes, the, not only that, does that become illegal, they actually enforce the death penalty on that. So remember that Roman Empire is very patriarchal uh, and and what they're enforcing there is male rule. It's the idea of a man transgressing the boundaries of what it means to be a man and what male power is based upon or how it expresses itself in Roman culture. That's the, that was so threatening to patriarchy that men who would take the receptive role or who would take the part of a woman in that language would get burned alive. And, and the idea of that was not only to punish the person, of course, but this was a public performance, uh, a public act of terrorism against receptive gay men. So it put everybody else in their place to, to quote Bishop Rawls and John Bupalon's work. Um, it, it was meant to be a very public threat against anybody who took it upon themselves to think that they could do that in private. They knew that should they be caught, that was a potential thing that could happen to them. And um, 
and you know, for the person who loves someone uh, and wants to express love in that way, uh, to think that you know, loving a person would mean he would get killed, that's going to cause a person to hold back as well. You know, it's an act of terrorism against both, um, but of course, uh, especially receptive men. So since then, um, you know, coming to contemporary times, Western Christendom continues to reinforce, and Christendom, when I use that word, what I want to be really clear, I'm not saying Christianity, I'm saying Christendom. Christendom is, what that means is when Christianity and empire mutually support each other. So Christendom is a political structure. It's, it's yeah, it's the structure that uses Christianity as a prop to uphold empire. All right, so once that came to be, um, it's continued to exist. We see it in the United States as well. It doesn't have to just be the Roman Empire. Um, we've seen it in colonialism. We've been talking about that for a while. And uh, it reinforces cis heteronormativity and misogyny, just like back in the Roman Empire, um, as religious issues. And, and Christendom in specific, Western Christendom in specific, comes about in about the year 800. Um, Charlemagne, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, he cobbles together a, more than his own French territory, but annexes, you know, invades, let's say, excuse me, colonizes, invades, and colonizes other European lands and, and tries to recreate the Roman Empire, and he calls it the Holy Roman Empire because he has the Pope at the time of the Bishop of Rome um, crown him, Charlemagne, so that they can they can show that they're they're reinforcing each other's power. The Pope uh, gives authority, this religious authority, to this idea that Charlemagne is this French king can invade all these other countries and call them an empire. And likewise, Charlemagne gives credibility to the Bishop of Rome that you're, you're now the head of the whole world church. You're not just the Bishop of Rome, one of, you know, five roughly equivalent bishops. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, that's Christendom. That's technically when Christendom starts in the, in the Middle Ages in, in Europe. Um, and that's when uh, anti-homosexuality or... or, or you know, violence against gay people and gender diverse people really ramps up in Christendom. Not so much in Christianity, but in Christendom, if that makes sense. And I mentioned to you before that, that basically where we see this kind of behavior happening, it's to reinforce patriarchy very clearly. The sexual taboos and the, the taboos about gender difference, uh, reinforcing extremes and how different they are, that's all, that all happens again and again wherever we see a patriarchal society. Um, so skipping ahead a little, I'm really giving you a thumbnail sketch of world history here and where these streams come together with religion. Um, we see this again. It continues to happen from the time of medieval Christian, Christendom. Christianity reinforces patriarchy by using misogyny and um, homophobia and transphobia as tools. And then we see it crop up again amongst in the Puritan era, you know, coming to North America now. Um, and it really gets clear uh, in the way that intersex people are dealt with in the Puritan era. So, you know, we've talked, before, well, again, this is a, an optional lecture, so you might not have looked at it, but, but intersex people are simply born, people with ambiguous genitalia, people who are not clearly easily assigned as either male or female um, on the extremes, right? The, those, we're, we're just born. There's a certain number of us, you know, from time to time that, that exist <laughs> and are born and it's obvious um and what happened is that that um some medical texts going all the way back to Edic uh, aristotle uh would called folks like us monsters um in i won't go through the whole history of intersex things that we could talk about but in any case so people that wanted to reclaim Aristotle's work for example the Protestant reformers and 
the Puritans, um, they they kind of reclaimed that kind of labeling. Um, but not everybody did that. So so some in some cases, uh, um, folks were just folks just lived it themselves. They didn't have like surgeries back in those days to change that situations people would hide it or they would do whatever they would do but um the, i guess what i'm trying to get at is that um puritan era christians colonial era christians in, in north america uh pathologized intersex bodies there's a lot more on here but i do want to show um I don't know whether I should skip this next slide or not. If you want to come back to it, you're going to see that if you if you choose to look at it, I've got some rather uh, a graphic slide of medical illustrations of the time, and you can see in the language in the medical textbook that there's racism going on, there's misogyny going on, um, definitely propping up patriarchy. And what I really want to get to beyond that slide as well is that what the real fear was about a person crossing sexual boundaries. So if a person had two functioning sets of or blended genitalia um, and could perform in a variety of ways sexually um, and might be attracted to men and might be attracted to women, that person's sexual orientation could not be policed. In specific, there was there was one we have you know legal records from the Virginia colony that were prisoners of Massachusetts colony. I think it's Virginia, but anyway, one of the colonies of a of a Puritan person who worked as a servant who was intersex, and even after medical examination, they could not the doctors of the time could not figure out we can't really assign this person one way or the other. They're just they just appear to be in the middle. This person. I had it sometimes um, had a male lover and at other times had uh, been with women. And um, that was the scandal for, that was the scandal for the Puritans was just, we can't assign this person to a particular gender and decide who they can marry and who they can't marry. Um, okay, so this is where I give you a content warning. Okay, so let me just stop the share just in case anybody doesn't wanna see that. And I will, Darn it. Okay, I'm going to skip the slide. There's also a, um, sorry, there's also a picture on that one of, I can't, I can't get back to what I was doing. There's a, oh, sorry. Okay, now we go back to screen share. Yeah, there's also the the slide I skipped. There's also a picture on there of um, uh, one of the medical textbooks that was based on Aristotle that shows how a hermaphrodite it has wings apparently and horns. And, but going back to that idea that we're seen as monsters, uh, and and so it goes back to that strategy that we talked about before of sort of uh, creating outrage and fear in of anybody that might be different, uh, that being a strategy that cultures use to police their boundaries. So, so making up things that just aren't true, but just, just to instill fear in anyone who might run across one of these minorities, you know, just don't, they're monsters. Um, so what I'm trying to get at here is, you know, the, this discussion of, of intersex people in the colonies, you could actually take a look at that resource yourself. It's fantastic. It is so, it's an article, it's a journal article, but it's so rich in covering the whole history of how it's really gender that's being policed. It's really, cis, it's heteronormativity that's being reinforced and specifically as a tool of patriarchy. It, but this is this is just such a good um, historical article that gives you a lot more than I'm just kind of trying to pique your interest <laughs> in reading that article maybe in some the one of the illustrations is from that article so there's more illustrations and more specific stories um, and primary sources in that article but the main idea that we want to see here is that while Puritans framed it as a religious issue uh, about how they were going yeah, about 
you know, God wants you to have only this one kind of sex and, it, you know, only within marriage and only for reproduction. Um, it seems like when we look at more of the data from that, those periods of time, uh, part of it is to um, pathologizing people. And again, it's not an innately religious issue, uh, but it's more a um, patriarchal culture issue if that makes sense. Anyway, you can look more about that. Okay, here's another thing. I actually removed the depiction, so uh, you don't have to worry about that when I took that out. And one of you, I believe, yeah, one of you did. One of, one of the people in this, in the, I don't know if you're taking this class now, but in one of our past classes, someone else found this research and shared um, this content. So I know you, some of you at least are aware of it. I took the graphics out because I, I just want to be uh, sensitive to not uh, glorifying in any way colonizers' violence against Indigenous people. And I know we would be outraged by this, but I still don't want to make you look at acts of violence against Indigenous people. So what I'm going to do instead is um, just let you know, and I'm not even going to spend a whole lot of time there. You can go back to that if you're, if if it's not triggering for you, or at a time when you have self care, self care for yourself to look at that. But um, the past slide was about how when colonizers came to both South America and North America, um, they specifically started attacking same sex couples hermaphrodites, uh, her, and, uh, that was the word that they used then, sorry, intersex people who were, uh, be, who were, who were healers, um, and nurses and so, so on and so forth, the people that, that tended the wounded and the sick, uh, but they attacked people that, that, well, I guess today we might call queer in any kind of way. Uh, they literally would, again, like we saw with the Roman Empire, they would do acts of violence to them in front of everybody else. Public murder, savage, torturing murder. Uh, they, they, I won't go into the details. Look, you can go back into it. I don't want to trigger anybody, but they did horrible things and they did them publicly and, um, it was very clear that you could, you weren't going to be allowed to live by the, these invaders uh, would not allow you to live were you a person who was not binary and gender and, you know, same sex partners were not allowed to be together. So um, the other, th so that's the past and I want to get to the present. Um, You've heard some, if you took the human rights class, you've heard some of this from Candy, but I also wanted to bring in some additional, Candy brings plenty, but uh, I wanted to bring in some additional information for you that um, according to the National Aboriginal Health Organization, two-spirit people, and I know it doesn't say this here, it says something else, but um, two-spirit people uh, are more likely to experience violence than heterosex uh, heterosexual people in First Nations or Indigenous communities and assault. Um, so, so, you know, Candy Brings Plenty talked about that a little bit in, um, in her work or their work. She uses, now I find they use both pronouns. Like, anyway, um, they're at risk. This is the point. You can read this for yourself and you can, the article that uh, the, the original source is linked here as well if you want to see more about it. My point is there, the, the heteronormativity was something that was imposed on indigenous people by colonizers and I know you already know that. There's more research that's up to date on how that continues to impact indigenous people who have internalized those binary understandings that were enforced by colonizers. So it continues to have this literally uh, uh, death dealing effect on indigenous people. Um, and I just wanted to show you in the same article, it quotes uh, a young person uh, in uh, about you know their experience of being a two-spirit person in the community and what they've dealt with. Um, there's a little bit more about higher risks for AIDS and HIV um, and, and violence. And 
psychological trauma. Um, I'm sharing here as well. This was something that was shared in our human rights class, but um, indigenous peoples around the world, not only in you know Turtle Island or North America, but around the world, um, indigenous African understandings of gender are have been shut down by col uh, or suppressed by colonizers' values. Um, if you were in the human rights class, you have probably already read this. If not, you can you can uh, see that we have the the citation there and see a little bit more about that. Um, we've talked in also in the human right, rights class about uh, homophobia in India and Pakistan being framed in religious terms as if traditional Indian religions would not recognize uh, gender diversity or same sex interactions whereas you know we've also seen that indian and pakistani scholars have said wait a minute this is this all and and thorson too his his work uh gave us examples that really these were these binary heteronormative categories were imposed by british colonizers on indian cultures that they were not homophobia is not innately indian or pakistani uh, and, and that there have been multiple genders, in particular the hijra, but not only the hijra, there are other, there's gender diversity in traditional Indian religion. It was actually part of their religious system. Um, the hijra, the third gender people have a unique devotional relationship to their understanding of God. They have a very important devotional, spiritual and religious role, but it's been suppressed since, um, you know, since the 1800s, when the when the British made being a hijra or, or cross dressing uh, illegal or immoral, immoral and illegal. Anyway, so what happens now is that um, again, just like we saw in Africa, just like we saw in North America, some people have internalized um the values that were imposed by colonizers so there are now st you know traditional indian teachers uh teaching traditional indian religious and spiritual practices and beliefs like baba ramdev who are promoting the idea that homosexuality is wrong and they're promoting it from an indian religious perspective but you know, obviously, I'm not going to read all this to you. The, the sources are cited there if you want to dig more deeply into this. But the point is, is that it seems pretty clear that even though you may find from time to time an Indian religious teacher teaching that homosexuality is wrong or could, could be or should be cured, um, that's not necessarily an indigenous Indian belief. That probably what's happened is uh, British attitudes colonizing and imperialistic attitudes have been imported and enforced and, and infected this culture so that now this seems to be an Indian religious value, but it doesn't, there's reasons to question that, right? Um, we're going to spend more time in this lecture on Judaism and Christianity, not just because uh, in the United States where this program is geographically housed, um, those traditions may be louder. Uh, not only that, but, but specifically the gender and sex minority folks in this context um, probably have been exposed more to um, biblically based arguments about why gender diversity and uh, same sex interactions are wrong. So um, we'll, we'll take a look at that a little bit more. And in, even in the political discourse, the Bible is, is usually brought in in the United States, even though we're supposed to have separation of church and state. Um, biblical arguments and Christian arguments are usually brought in for um, any kind of legislation that's supposed to limit um, LGBTQ people in any kind of way. So we do want to just point out that um, the, the Bible, the sacred text, 
of Christians and Jews, the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures in specific that some Christians call the Old Testament while called the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew scriptures. Um, the Hebrew scriptures actually have a lot of gender diversity within them. So it's there. there is not necessarily innately or inherently a view that all people are created either male or female. In fact, and I, I, I've mentioned this before, and Bishop Tanya Rawls has mentioned this before in our program, but uh, the first human is not divided into binary genders yet. And I don't think Bishop Rawls brought this up, but I'm going to bring it up now, uh, that, that God uses plural pronouns. God's pronouns are they, them in, in the early portions of the Bible. So, um, so intersex people definitely are created in the image of God, you know, using the, the language of the Bible itself. Uh, and then going on to Christian scriptures, the letter to the Galatians, uh, Apostle Paul says, in Christ, there is no male or female. So there's, there's my point in bringing this up is to say, yes, we're going to look at where the roots of this religious trauma coming from Christianity and biblical traditions comes from. And even before we get into that, I want to make sure that we understand that I'm not saying that Christianity itself or Judaism itself is innately homophobic because I, it, that doesn't seem to be accurate. It can be interpreted that way. It has been interpreted that way, but it doesn't necessarily have to be interpreted that way. So what I really want to get into is that there are only six verses in the whole Bible that are used repeatedly um, to exclude LGBTQ Christians and Jews. Um, in, in Jews, it's even less because one of them is in the, in the Christian part of the Bible. But anyway, there's only six pas verses, not even full passages, but verses that are used as what we, what, queer people in these traditions call clobber passages to kind of knock us out of the community. Um, and I think it's significant that even evangelical Christians who are scholars of these, uh, of this, uh, you know, who's, who are scholars, I will say that, literary scholars, people that study using the original languages, what those texts, those sacred texts actually say, even they have admitted that there's actually nothing in the Bible as such about homosexuality. Um, so I, I'm, I linked for you here an article where that's really laid out in a very succinct way, even from the conservatives of those traditions. And they go step by step through those six scriptures. Um, if you're a person who's had any negative interactions with people in those traditions and has had those scriptures used against you, it might be helpful to have access to that information or be able to pass it on to somebody. Um, and I made a couple of really short videos for Campus Pride in 2015 when they were doing a social media campaign called LGBTQ Not Sin uh, because I was a theologian. You know, that was my profession. And, and I, anyway, they asked me to do this. So, so I helped them launch the campaign. So the point is there's a couple of really short slideshows you could look at if you like that type of thing. In one of them, I don't even talk. <laughs> it's just slides. But they're, they're not like these ones. They're only like four minutes and six minutes. But, um, but anyway, it might be helpful if you like that format. You can look there. But I got the information from the evangelicals concerned because that was the audience we were trying to reach out to. So in brief, if you don't want to go dig deeper, in brief, the clobber passages, um, these are where you can find them. I'm not going to go into that now, but what they actually do describe is, if you look at them in context, two equal partners who were formed from one androgynous human. That's the part where he created them, male and female, he created them. This doesn't say he, but anyway, um, so, so two people are pulled apart from this one androgynous person. And the, and the point of the passage is if you look at it again, like in looking at the first several chapters, the point is that they work together, they're partners. Um, 
and then Sodom and Gomorrah. That's a passage that's often used. So um, if you look at it, not just in that passage, even in that passage, you can see this, but definitely if you see every other time after that, that the Bible, the Hebrew scriptures, the prophets, and those that follow uh, talk about the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, what they always talk about is inhospital inhospitality to the stranger, greed, wealth hoarding, uh, sexual violence as because the people that were threatened in Sodom, if you read the story are the daughters. Uh, so in, anyway, it's, it's been misinterpreted, but um, anyway, you can read this for yourself. This is all in the material that, uh, that I mentioned in the videos or on the other website. But the point is that these, these passages certainly exist, but they're not talking about homosexuality. They're not talking about same-sex marriage. Um, they're talking about even wider issues that in fact would indict a lot of the people who use these as clobber passages, you know, being uh, sexually predatory, being um, selfish, being greedy, um, making money from their religion, exploiting young people, not treating their partner and partner like an equal. So yeah, they don't deal with gender identity. Trans and intersex identities, they're not explicitly addressed in the Bible as such. They're, so they're not framed as sin because they're not discussed at all. Um, like I said, the first human seems to have been someone that was we might describe today as intersex. Um, and there are some other passages that seem to praise diversity, including gender diversity, or at least gender equality, equality, excuse me. Um, there's a lot of uh, some of the, the passages that are used to, there's one passage about cross-dressing, but it's in, a, in framed around other passages where there's a death penalty for things that we routinely do today. Um, so there's more here on that. There were rural, ancient rural practices that had to do with upholding patriarchal culture. So to take one of those verses out of context in a totally different culture and try to apply it today is questionable. Um, anyway, there's, there's a source cited there from Justin Tannis, who at one point was going to teach in this program and wasn't able to join us this first time around, but maybe we'll get to work with him later. And he's a trans theologian um, where he, and he unpacks this quite a lot. Um, so I mentioned this to, oh, I, it's, a, it's a, an optional lecture. You may not have seen it. But anyway, so religious organizations in the community in the US include about the same amount of gay people as the generation, general population does. So again, these communities don't have to be exclusive. In fact, whether they know it or believe it or not, they have the same amount of gay people in the churches as they would find out of the churches. However, even that, though that's the case, and these religious communities have religious uh, gay people in them or queer people in them, they, the, it's the religious communities that disproportionately oppose the civil rights of LGBTQ people. And we'll see more about that in week three as well. So I have a little bit of data on that for you. Um, and you can just see how that, how that plays out. You can see more of the data here. If you're a data person <laughs> and you want to see that, and the sources are there as well. Um, so another thing, to, the consequences of that is, is as these communities, religious communities, preach that homosexuality is something that should be fixed or that it's wrong or that they don't have any gay people, even though they do, or any of those things that they're doing, um, we see that that affects LGBTQ people in that even though they're in the churches and they may have been, they're just as likely to have been raised in churches as people who aren't queer. Um, our religious and affiliation changes as we get older. You know, the more we experience this kind of bullying and harassment and trauma, the, our likelihood to stay affiliated with religions is in contrast with the general population. But what's interesting is it's not that we necessarily leave religion and spirituality, it's that 
our affiliation will change. We won't necessarily, we're less likely to stay in the community in which we were raised if that community has been traumatizing us and bullying us. I mean, it seems like a no brainer, but there's, there's, uh, there you go. <laughs> there's data on that. So again, if you're someone that likes to see the, the hard numbers, uh, we've got some, and you know, I haven't found updates of this yet other than Lisa's work, Lisa Salazar's work, but, um, but I'm sure that um, that's, that would be a wonderful thing for folks to work on. And if any of you find it, maybe we can bring it up in week four and update and share resources together. So what I wanted to talk about was less overt things too. So, so one of the things aside from the outright, you know, preaching from the pulpit sort of thing, um, there's, there's the ways that um, queer people internalize, we talked about it a little bit already, um, this sort of systemic violence uh, that, that we're surrounded by in religious cultures that tell us either that we don't exist or that who we are is wrong or that our relationships are wrong. And so this is a, um, this is a tool that comes from the National Domestic Violence Hotline uh, for LGBT relationships. Um, and I just wanted to share it here. I've got a link to the resource and a link to the parent site as well on here if you wanna explore this a little bit more. But it's really helpful to see kind of those dynamics that I mentioned before from Mary Douglas's work about how um, the various forms of threats, implicit threats, um, isolating people, passive aggressive, minimizing, um, squeezing people out of jobs and housing, um, threats, and not, not only overt violence, uh, how these things impact people, their ways of exerting control over people without necessarily going all the way to overt violence. And just some more dynamics of that power and control now that you've seen that wheel and you see power and control are in the center. As you extend outward, you get towards overt acts of violence, but it's, it's a gradient, you know, from these behaviors that just express the power and control in more subtle ways to the overt violence. So, so what we're seeing is the dynamics that they're rooted in patriarchy at the center of that power and control, the male supremacy. Um, heterosexism is a dynamic there, homo negativity. So the, let me just go back for a second. So the denying, minimizing, and, and blaming, the emotional abuse, the intimidation, the coercion and threats, um, those can take these forms of, well, it's better to be heterosexual or oh, that's so gay, you know, any kind of homonegativity, uh, heteronormativity. Well, it's natural to, for a man to marry a woman. That's what's more natural. Or rendering just rendering people invisible. So I know in the intersex community, we all often sort of half joke among ourselves, oh, the LGBT, the I in LGBTQI stands for invisible. And especially since the I is usually like the first thing dropped when people are like, oh, alphabet soup. Um, so invisibility too is it's a form of power and control we're just going to deny you exist because it's too awkward for you're too awkward to deal with you know we don't want to have to account for you um I just wanted to show you that some resources there on the bottom of the slide if you want more on that sort of how wording can be a microaggression that it helps uh maintain power and control Family rejection as relational trauma is related to religion. So I wanted to talk about, you know, we're talking about biblical religions right now. So those dynamics are things that we see in the biblical religions sometimes. Um, in Judaism, we see, for example, there's an article here. This could happen in any religious tradition. I'm just sharing something specific in U.S. Judaism right now. Orthodox Judaism sometimes uh, folks feel that they need to not acknowledge their gender minority or sexual orientation identity minority members. Um, and for folks that have gender transitioned, um, sometimes their transition, it, when they pass on, their funeral rites are actually in their birth assigned name and gender. They're what we call dead name. Um, 
we saw this, this came from structures of acceptance. So this was uh, Dr. Caitlin Ryan's work on things that happen in religious communities that cause serious health and mental problems. Um, and these are coming again from often from Christian uh, perspectives, uh, really these monotheistic traditions that they were that are expressing an idea that God's going to punish you for being gay. Um, and behaviors that parents in those religious traditions seem to routinely do thinking that they're helping their child because if they can only change their child, even if it comes to, you know, going back to that wheel of violence, if even if they have to use violence or coercion or whatever to help their child change, they think in the long run, that's going to do less harm because then the child won't have to grow up to be gay and excluded from their religious community and live alone and not be able to give them grandchildren and you know even worse maybe go to hell right so um the families are doing these really harassing violent abusive things but they think they're doing something helpful and we see here what the real outcomes are in terms of depression and suicide attempts and drug use you know that's been brought up in a lot of these different slides if you have time to go back including like the native american community um, there's a little bit more specific to trans people here where those risks seem to be heightened. And um, we, you know, I actually already brought this up. Even in queer communities, sometimes uh, certain, there are people who are minorities within the queer minority. And, and some of those microaggressions of power and control get used even within queer community. So, um, you know, I wanted to be a little bit in the solution here as we get to the end of thing and share some ideas of ways that we can not traumatize people where we can help build resilience or prevent trauma just by being mindful of the words that we use. I'm sure for most people in this class, this is very um, elementary, but these are some tools that I use when I do trainings in religious communities or when I used to do trainings in religious communities that were just at the beginning of this journey. So feel free to share this and Q community does this great printable card that I linked here for you if you are ever have occasion where you'd like to help somebody. Because I, I know some of you have families uh, that are still in religious situations or you're still participating or related to communities where this might be helpful. Um, these are some more tools for allies from GLSEN um, and um, from other groups, but you know, also helpful tools that you might want to pass on to folks if they, if you're experiencing trauma, I'm just actually helping you be resilient or help other people um, do better. I didn't want to end on a sour note, you know. So um, depending on the, issue, the order in which you watch the lectures, you might have already watched some of my own personal narrative of where you know just especially more for allies if <clears throat> you're curious about how these dynamics of trauma religious trauma syndrome actually play out in a person's life um, in order to introduce myself to those of you who are maybe this is your first class in the program uh, and also to give examples without violating anybody else's privacy uh, i shared a little bit about religious trauma syndrome in my own and up to a certain point in my children's lives i only shared what i have permission to share there that's not going to be something i will continue to share but there are some moments of that that were pretty public um but my main uh word of encouragement to you is that from here on in we're going to move toward looking not only at stress but mm, uh, on resilient, we're going to look at resilience. We're going to look at a gender minority and sex minority res resilience, um, where people are finding spirituality and religion to be a resilience factor for them in their own specific ways. And I'll, I'll share a little bit about my story with that too, as well, just to illustrate that. But you know, that's not essential. Um, you're welcome to dive into that if you want to to supplement what you're learning. All right, so from here we go to resilience. Thanks, bye.